Um, well, thank you for logging in to this uh, webinar hosted by Natricia. Thank you to Natricia for asking me to speak. And I'm going to talk to you um, this afternoon about drug resistant epilepsy. Um, my name is Dr. Manny Bagri. Um, I'm an epileptologist and neuropsychiatrist based in Birmingham. And I also run an adult ketogenic diet clinic for drug resistant epilepsy. which trying to advance my slides, there we go. These are my disclosures, um, got no conflicts of interest. And this presentation is, is tended for healthcare professionals only. And the opinions expressed are those of, of myself. So the, the target audience for this uh, particular talk um, are primary care physicians, epilepsy specialist nurses, dietitians, um, students in healthcare, and also hospital consultants who don't particularly work in specialist epilepsy centers. And what I'm aiming to do is take you through what we mean by epilepsy. Um, for those of you who are not involved on a day-to-day -day basis with epilepsy patients, but might be interested in things like the ketogenic diet, what we mean by drug-resistant epilepsy and what the implications are. Um, and then if we do find somebody has got a drug-resistant epilepsy, what can we do about it to improve quality of life? So what do we mean by seizure? A seizure is the clinical manifestation of excessive synchronous abnormal firing of large populations of neurons. A seizure can manifest in many different ways. And most of you will be familiar with some of these terms. Um, Tonic-clonic seizures occur in 60% of our patients. Um, we have focal onset seizures, which can, which previously were referred to as complex partial seizures. These seizures often start in one particular part of the brain. And if a patient then loses awareness, we use the term complex partial. They, they occur in 20% of our patients. And the seizure may also be simple partial. Um, and this means al although they start in one particular part of the brain, they don't spread to the other, other hemisphere so that patient doesn't lose awareness during those particular seizures. And occasionally we'll get mixed seizures, which are generalized and focal onset. And we have a range of other generalized seizures, such as absence, myoclonic, atonic, and tonic, which constitute approximately 5% of seizures. So this particular slide takes us through what happens from having a seizure to having a diagnosis of epilepsy. So this slide, is looking at the number of, once a patient's had a first seizure, what's the likelihood of a patient having a second and then a third seizure? And after two unprovoked seizures, you can see here these timelines, at 24 months and 60 months, the risk of a third seizure doesn't really change. Um, and the IALE, the International League Against Epilepsy, have adapted the lower range of this risk at around about 60%, um, as implying there's a risk of recurrent unprovoked seizures at 60%, which then is used as a baseline for diagnosing epilepsy. So the ILA definition of epilepsy, um, based on their 2014 guidelines, is that epilepsy is the brain disease associated with spontaneously recurring seizures. And the implication is there's a 60% chance of recurrence of further seizures. That's the threshold that's been set. Um, generally for diagnosis, we want two unprovoked or reflex seizures, which are at least 24 hours apart, or one unprovoked or reflex seizure, which has the same probability of further seizures of around 60% over the next 10 years or so or a diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome. So now that we know what a seizure is, how we diagnose epilepsy, we want to look at the incidence and prevalence. And the incidence of epilepsy is about 0.5 cases per 1,000 per year in the UK. This is based on 2010 UK census data, which means we have about 32,000 new cases every year in the UK. 
and the prevalence of epilepsy, how common this is in the population, is about 0.97%. So we have about 600,000 patients in the UK with epilepsy. About 3% of them are photosensitive. And one other thing that we need to just really bear in mind is the rate of misdiagnosis is, is very, very high. About 20 to 30 percent of patients who have the diagnosis of epilepsy don't actually have epilepsy. They have something that looks like epilepsy phenotypically, but the cause is maybe psychological, stress related, or it may be a form of fainting, syncope, or a range of other conditions. So the cause of epilepsy, um, you can see there's, there's two pie charts here on this slide. On the left, um, we used to think most of these epilepsies were idiopathic. Um, and then we have a range of causes such as trauma, stroke, tumor, infection, congenital lesions, birth asphyxia and other causes. But over recent years, we've come to understand the, a number of autoimmune causes and we can pick up some lesions on MRI scans, which are um, useful for prognosis because a lot of these patients may benefit from epilepsy surgery. And the idiopathic epilepsies, we know, are mainly genetically inherited, um, often with complex inheritance, but some single gene disorders have been identified. So just looking at the incidence of epilepsy, you can see here that this is the age going from birth up to 90. So I just skipped a couple of slides there. Um, and that's the incidence per 100,000 on the left um, on the y-axis. And you can see there's a bimodal distribution with a higher incidence in early childhood, then a much higher incidence from around the age of 55 onwards. And if we look at the causes, we can see in childhood, uh, early childhood, um, it's predominantly neurodevelopmental causes. And as you get older and 65 and above, it's mainly cerebrovascular causes. And in the middle, young to middle adult range, um, if there are new onset seizures, we just have to make sure it's not um, a traumatic or a malignant cause. So does epilepsy go away? Um, early again in their guidelines in 2014, suggested some guidelines as to what it means for epilepsy to be resolved. And by resolved, it means that epilepsy is no longer present, but doesn't guarantee that it will never come back. So the first criteria was age-dependent epilepsy, but now past the applicable age. This is something like juvenile absence epilepsy, which tends to burn itself out in, in early adolescence or being seizure free for at least 10 years and having no anticonvulsant treatment for at least five years. So we've talked about a number of seizures. Uh, we can divide them up into focal and generalized seizures. When we talk about focal seizures, they originate within the neural networks limited to one hemisphere. Now, they, that may remain in that one hemisphere. Um, that will be a simple partial seizure, or it may spread to the other hemisphere where it becomes a complex partial seizure because it will affect consciousness um, as it spreads across the temporal lobes. Generalized seizures originate within a rapidly, they originate within a network and rapidly engage that network to spread bilaterally. Um, so you get um, distributed epilepsy and discharge across both hemispheres of the brain. Um, it may involve cortical and subcortical structures, but it doesn't necessarily involve the whole of the cortex. In terms of classifying the seizures, the ILA reclassified in 2017. And the terminology now is focal onset seizures, where they're aware or impaired awareness, which is the old simple partial and complex partial seizures, generalized seizures, which are the old tonic-clonic seizures, and those of un unknown onset. And for focal onset seizures, the motor onset can take many different forms. 
and can constitute different seizure types, such as atonic, clonic, or automatisms, which are semi purposeful movements. For non motor onset, it can be autonomic symptoms, either things like flushing and sweating, or it could just be behavioral arrest, um, where, where people just stop what they're doing, or it could involve cognitive symptoms or emotional symptoms. For seizures of generalized onset, we may get convulsive seizures, tonic clonic, or just the jerking component, which is clonic, or just the stiffness, which is tonic. And for non-motor onset, we may just get blank spells. And those of unknown onset may have motor or non-motor components. So what would happen to a patient who's just been diagnosed with epilepsy? What would their prognosis be? And this is taken from Professor Martin Brody, who's done a lot of work on drug treatments in newly diagnosed epilepsy. And you can see from this slide, exposure to the first anticonvulsant, the response rate is just under 50%. A further 13% become seizure free with exposure to the second anticonvulsant. Then between the second and the seventh anticonvulsant, only a further 5% of patients become seizure free. And beyond the seventh, although the numbers aren't huge, um, no, no further seizure freedom um, was noted. So we're looking at a seizure freedom rate of around 65 to 70% for those newly diagnosed patients. And the rest, those 30% or so, would constitute drug resistant epilepsy. So just to recap, when we talk about epilepsy, we talk about seizure types, which may be focal onset, starting in one particular part of the brain, generalized onset, affecting circuits in both hemispheres, or unknown onset. The epilepsy type might be focal, generalized, combined, or unknown. And then we have a range of epilepsy syndromes. The etiology may be structural, genetic, infectious, metabolic, immune, may be unknown. And we have a range of comorbidities in epilepsy, such as cognitive impairment and mental health comorbidity. So just to recap in terms of what's likely to happen with a newly diagnosed patient epilepsy, about 70% become seizure free, either on or off medication. 30% or so become drug resistant. We have a treatment gap where about 18% of patients, 108,000 in the UK, should be seizure free who are not seizure free, as we only have about 52% of our patients seizure free rather than the 70% that would be predicted. We need to bear in mind that epilepsy is not a benign condition. There are about 1,000 epilepsy related deaths per year, half of which are due to sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Mental health, health comorbidity is common, particularly in those drug resistant patients. And we've already mentioned misdiagnosis. And if we take a misdiagnosis rate of around 23%, that's 138,000 patients who are misdiagnosed with epilepsy. So this has huge cost implications, direct medical costs of around 46 million, non-medical costs of around 220 million, total costs of around 270 million. So it's important to get the diagnosis right. So I mentioned SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. This means a sudden death not expected, it may be witnessed or unwitnessed, it's not traumatic, it's unrelated to drowning, and there may or may not have been evidence for a seizure. It's, we exclude documented status epilepticus, and the post-mortem examination does not reveal a structural or toxicological cause for death. So what might predict SUDEP? Um, epilepsy of long duration, often childhood onset, drug resistance, tonic-clonic seizures, seizures in sleep, poor adherence to anticonvulsants or treatment. And there are a number of um, apps that, that can be used and checklists for safety for CDEP. In particular, there's the Apsmon app, which has been used by quite a few patients now um, to moderate the risk of CDEP. So what are the poor prognostic indicators? Those patients may become drug resistant those with a structural lesion 
poor response to first line anticonvulsants, focal seizures, and a long duration of seizures. So again, the ILAE, the Internationally Against Epilepsy, have defined drug resistance as some of the um, criteria have been a little bit variable. So based on their 2009 guidelines, drug resistance is failure of adequate trials of two tolerated and appropriate anticonvulsants, either in monotherapy or in combination therapy to achieve seizure freedom. And what's meant by seizure freedom is whichever is the longer of three times the prior into seizure interval. So if somebody's having several seizures a month, you'll know within two months or so whether that patient is going to become seizure free. If somebody's having one seizure a year or two seizures a year for diagnosis, you may need to wait quite a long time to work out if that patient's going to become seizure free. And often we use 12 months as, as a guideline. So if we do diagnose drug resistance in our patients, what do we need to do? First thing we need to do is review the diagnosis. As we know, around 30% of patients who have drug resistance don't have epilepsy. So we need to make sure the original diagnosis is secure. Have we observed the seizures? Do we have a good collateral history? Do we understand the seizure type and the epilepsy syndrome? Are they consistent? Do the investigations fit with the clinical seizures? Is our patient adherent with their medication or treatment? And if we're unsure, it'd be useful to get a second opinion from a specialist epilepsy service. So what do we mean by a specialist epilepsy service? It is a service where staff have specialist training in epilepsy, whether they're nurses or medics, and they've got access to specialist investigations, assessment and treatment. So specialist centres will have access to um, neurophysiology in the form of video telemetry, where seizures can be recorded and videoed simultaneously. Specialist centres also have access to intracranial monitoring, where electrodes can be placed um, on the brain surface or actually directly into the brain to determine a particular focus. They'll have access to sophisticated imaging, including high resolution structural MRI scans, functional MRI scans, diffusion tensor imaging, MEG, which is magnetic encephalography, PET scans and SPEC scans. Detailed cognitive assessments and assessments of mental health comorbidity. And if we do find our patient has a lesional epilepsy, and this means they have a structural lesion on their brain MRI scan, we would refer for a surgical opinion. And during the surgical pathway, those patients would be investigated with video telemetry, either on the scalp or intracranially, have sophisticated imaging, cognitive testing, and assessment of comorbidities. So with our video telemetry, what we want to do is actually find the seizure onset zone. If you look at this diagram here, you can see in the temporal lobes, we have an irritative zone which is the cortical area that generates the interruptal spikes on the EG. Um, but what we actually want is the, if I can find my mouse, there we go. We want the epileptogenic zone or the, or the seizure onset zone where if the surgeon removes that, we will remove the lesion or disconnect the lesion from the network, which will result in seizure freedom. We also want to understand where eloquent cortex is, and this is the area of cortex that would cause a functional deficit, um, for example, a stroke or visual impairment if resected. And we clearly don't want to go anywhere near eloquent cortex for operating. So especially centers can do intracranial recordings. They can either have grids on the brain surface, each of these yellow dots is representative of an electrode which records or strips across the brain surface or centers are more and more moving towards depth electrodes which gives very detailed recordings, stereo EG recordings. And we can see in this MRI scan, you see here on the left side, um, we're looking at a patient with left mesial temporal sclerosis. You can see this relatively normal hippocampus on the right and this atrophied hippocampus on the left with some high signal coming from that hippocampus. 
we can do functional blood flow scans and we, this is the PET scan of a patient and you can see a normal scan where blood flow is equal uh, on both sides of the temporal lobes and this patient with epilepsy you can see here that reduction in blood flow compared to the other side and we see this hypermetabolism in between seizures interrupting. We may want to evaluate um, further for surgery using functional magnetic imaging and we can do language lateralization, memory localization and look at the epileptic, epileptic focus. So if our patients with drug resistant epilepsy do undergo surgery, what's the outcome? This is data from the Cleveland Clinic and this is the seizure freedom rate at one year through to 12 years and you can see that the seizure freedom rate is in the region of 70% to 12 months and at five years it's just over just over 60%. Um, so fairly good outcomes but it's not 100%. So if we can't operate on our patients what else can we do in patients with a non-lesion epilepsy? There may be an option to use other anticonvulsants and we could use rational ph pharmacotherapy, which means using drugs that work through a different mechanism of action. We may be able to use neurostimulation, palliative surgery, or possibly dietary treatments. So if we're thinking about using new drugs, um, is there much evidence that our sage patients will become seizure-free as we've already defined them to be drug resistant? So this is an interesting study from Schiller. Um, they, look, they introduced a the concept of relative rather than absolute drug resistance. And they found patients who had failed two anticonvulsants, were they, they felt were considered to be relatively resistant, whereas those patients who had had six anticonvulsants were un unlikely to obtain seizure freedom. So in their study of 488 patients, 16% of patients became seizure free with the addition of an anticonvulsant, even after failure of between two and five previous anticonvulsants. And a further study from Callahan, looking at drug resistant patients. This is 246 patients followed up for six years. And I think the important figure here is that 5% per year became seizure free for at least 12 months in this six year follow up. However, the caveat is that most of these patients, three quarters of them relapsed within six years of achieve, achieving um, remission for 12 months. So if we are gonna use um, new drugs, which ones should we choose? We know that there was a huge burst of drug development um, through the 1980s up until recently and even now we've had um, three new drugs actually four new drugs with with cannabidiol over the last few years reticabine, reticabine we no longer use because of ocular um, problems and pigmentation fingernails um, the significance of which is un unclear but we have a huge number of drugs that we can consider um, but there's little evidence as to which ones we should be adding in, which combination we should be using, whether some combinations work best than others, and whether some mechanisms of anticonvulsant action work best than others. So for rational polytherapy, we'd be using drugs that work through different mechanisms of action, but there really isn't robust evidence that guide us um, about this concept. And this is quite a detailed slide, but this lists some of the common anticonvulsants on the left hand side and also the major mechanisms of action. You can see the sodium channel blockers like phenytoin, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, oxcarbazepine, and then the slow sodium channel blockers, um, lacosamide, eslicarbazepine. And it may be that if a patient's already on a sodium channel blocker, you may not want to add in a second sodium channel blocker. You may want to think about 
a drug that works through a different mechanism of action, um, maybe such as valparate. Um, the other option is to think about non-drug treatments. In a range of non-drug treatments, we have palliative surgery. Um, this may involve a callosotomy, it's lesion in the two hemispheres, hemispherectomy or subpial resection, which is not used very often, or most commonly, it'll be neurostimulation. There are a range of neurostimulation techniques available, but vagal nerve stimulation is perhaps the most commonly adopted in the UK. And this involves stimulating the vagus nerve in the neck. Um, electrodes are placed around the left vagus nerve. Um, it's felt that the left vagus nerve has less effect on the heart than the right vagus nerve. And you can see the stimulator here implanted just below the collarbone. A wire goes up and is implanted onto the vagus nerve in the neck and stimulates to begin with for 30 seconds every five minutes or so. So it's a fairly straightforward surgical procedure. And if you look at the response rates to vagal nerve stimulation, just to orientate you with this slide, these bars are the median seizure reduction. Sorry, the, the bars are the responder rate. This black line at the top is a median seizure reduction and the gray line is a seizure freedom. So we know quality of life is intrinsically linked to seizure freedom. So for vagal nerve stimulation, at around four months, the seizure freedom rates are about five or 6%. And then at 24 months to 48 months, it goes up to about 8%. The response rates are around 50 to 60%. And by response rates, we mean a 50% reduction in seizure frequency. Most trials of ketogenic diet are fairly short. And this is the, probably the comparator that we need to look at. So, the other option for non-drug treatments is ketogenic diet. Um, ketogenic diet first came into favour in the 1920s. It's a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And you can see with this burst of drug development, interest waned a little bit. However, in the 1990s, um, medics again became interested in the ketogenic diet for drug resistant epilepsy. And the reason for this is, although we've had a huge number of new drugs over the last 20 or 30 years, the seizure freedom rates haven't improved. They're stubbornly remaining at around 30%. So why, why would we want to use ketogenic diet in epilepsy? So we know glucose is the main metabolic substrate for neurons. Uh, we know insulin suppresses ketogenesis, but if the patient is starving or has glycogen depletion or low insulin levels, this could promote ketogenesis and ketone bodies can supply the basal energy up to about 50% of requirements for most tissues or 70% of the brain. The range of ketogenic diets available. Um, back in the 1920s, the classical ketogenic diet was, was the one that was used most often, which is a four to one ratio of fat to protein and carbohydrate in grams, often started in patient. We still use the classical ketogenic diet at times. Often we'll start with a modified ketogenic diet or a modified Atkins diet. This often means a restriction in carbohydrates in the diet to around 20 grams, but varies between 10 to 30 grams. The fat to protein and carbohydrate ratio is a one-to-one. -one. And the big advantage of the, this particular diet of the classical diet is that it's much better tolerated and can start as an outpatient. We also have the option of a medium chain triglyceride diet, or there's a little bit of evidence for this low glycemic index diet. So looking at these ketogenic diets, they've been reviewed by Cochrane three or four times, and most recently in November 2018, which is the most up-to-date review. Children, looking at children, there have been eight randomized controlled trials each lasting three to four months. Seizure freedom rates are around one to 15%, and the 50% reduction in seizure frequency is around 38 to 56%. And 
Unfortunately, there's much less evidence in adults. There's only one randomized controlled trial, which looked at the modified Atkins versus control patients in 66 subjects over a two month period. Nobody in the modified Atkins group or the control group achieved seizure freedom, but the seizure reduction rates at 50% were 35% for the dietary group and 0% for the control group. However, there are lots of studies in adults with ketogenic diet in the form of cohort analysis. Um, this was reviewed in a meta-analysis in 2015. 12 studies were included, specifically in adults involving 270 patients. And using this meta-analysis, the efficacy of the ketogenic diet was around 42% and the adherence to the ketogenic diet was also around 45%. And this is consistent with other reviews that have been done. So although we have very little in the way of randomized controlled trial evidence for adults with ketogenic diet, we do have a lot of evidence from around the world that it is effective um, in terms of reducing the seizure frequency in, these, in drug resistant patients. And also in terms of patient selection, we know that specific patient groups, ketogenic diet is the recommended treatment, such as those with glucose transporter one deficiency or pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. There's some evidence that patients with infantile spasms or Lennox-Gastaut syndrome or Dravet syndrome would also benefit from, from the ketogenic diet. But the overall evidence from the adult cohort studies is that it can be effective in any type of epilepsy. So the other situation where ketogenic diet might be useful is in convulsive refractory status epilepticus. These are patients in ITU who've been seizing for 24 hours despite being anesthetized. So I just wanted to mention a small study um, that looked at the use of ketogenic diet in ITU in refractory status epilepticus. Um, refractory status epilepsy was, was defined as failure of two anticonvulsants. Patients were, the ketogenic diet was in, introduced and ketosis was considered to be present at a level of 1.9 millimoles per litre. So 14 patients were included, all young, mean age of just under five years. Ketogenic diet was used quite late. Um, with a median range of 13 days after the onset of refractory status epilepticus. However, it seemed to be quite successful. Um, seizure resolution was achieved within seven days, so within a week of starting ketogenic diet in 10 out of 14 patients, which is 71% of patients. And 79% of these patients were weaned off their infusion treatments within 14 days. So although we have limited evidence, um, there may be an opportunity to try and use ketogenic diet in those patients on ITU and refractory status epilepticus. So some of the side effects and we need to watch for with the ketogenic diet, particularly in children, lack of weight gain. Um, they need a rescue protocol if the patients become hypoglycemic, but generally the modified ketogenic diet is fairly well tolerated. Also in children, we'd watch for kidney stones and in adults, particularly changes in lipid profiles. Now, I just wanted to show you a video of, of one of my patients um, who's been treated with the ketogenic diet, who explains her, explains the benefit, I think, of using this treatment.
into uh, young life being passive a lot of healing styles. I think one of the biggest things I found difficult was when I went spiritually because I had B12 rejection. Um, the nurses were just so anti, not just um, horrified. show an interest, they didn't ask me what it was called, so that um, I said about Matthew's friends, God like, not one of them ever said, oh I'll have a look, and when I go back again and again, not one of them said, oh where's a look at Matthew's friends to, to see what the, uh, that, you know, I mean, it was, it was very disappointing, because you felt you were swimming against the tide. I would, but I think we have to be quite, you know, to make it quite clear that everybody will work their own way out with it. I sort of think of it, it's like a microwave, we've all got microwaves, but no two people use them in the same way. You all have, you know, your own way of doing things and, and managing it. So I would certainly say for me, I'm not saying it's easy, it's not a pushover, it takes a lot of will and planning. See, that's me, you know what I mean? It suits my temperament. Um, but um, I'm sure that that's the only line of reason for me because I'm in control. So a couple of interesting points were raised there. Um, in particular, what we do with lipids in patients who are on the KitchenAid diet or adults. In children, generally, they're on the diet for two years after which it's withdrawn. Um, in adults, as with children, we review it three months. If there's a 50% reduction then, and the patient's tolerating the diet, we continue with it. What we found in our cohort of patients with lipid, lipid profiling is that the cholesterol will often go up um, early in the diet and then will come back down within about six to eight weeks below the level um, at which the patient started. We've only had to use statins in, in a handful of patients, but there is this issue of what we do with patients with, with lipid profiles that we worry about for cardiovascular risk. Um, at the end of the two years, we've got some patients who've had ketogenic diet long term. We have a conversation with, with, with our patient um, and decide together whether to carry on with, with the diet or not. And so far, um, most of our patients who have become seizure free or the seizures have reduced significantly on the diet have elected to stay on the diet and they're tolerating it fairly well. So just to finish off, um, in patients with a, a pharmacoresistant or a drug resistant epilepsy, the most important predictor of quality of life is seizure freedom. So in those patients who are drug resistant, we must make sure that we've worked out whether that patient is a surgical candidate. If they are a surgical candidate, we need to refer to, to a center that has a surgical pathway because the seizure freedom rates may be up, up to around 60%. If they're not a surgical candidate, we need to consider other options to reduce the seizures. Um, and the options are using other anticonvulsants, novel anticonvulsants, which haven't been tried previously, or combining anticonvulsants through different mechanisms of action, or alternatively using neurostimulation, such as vagal nerve stimulation, or the other option, certainly in children, is ketogenic diet. And in adults, there, there are two, perhaps two, maybe three centres that can offer ketogenic diet in adults, but it's very difficult to access services at present for adults. The other components of quality of life, which are just as important, are neuropsychiatric comorbidity. There are high rates of depression in this population of patients, and also anticonvulsant toxicity. What that means is, is that the drugs we're giving our patients sometimes cause more side effects than benefits. And when 
lots of authors have, have looked at quality of life in drug resistant patients. The neuropsychiatric comorbidity and the anticonvulsant toxicity are often more important than seizure control in terms of predicting quality of life. So it's really important that we, we screen for neuropsychiatric comorbidity and treat as we can. And we also are very mindful of anticonvulsant toxicity. And just to remind you, um, I'm sure you all know this, but drug resistant epilepsy is complex. It needs a holistic approach to maximize quality of life. So we need to think about rational polypharmacy. We need to think about seizure control, depression, anticonvulsant toxicity, bone density. A lot of the drugs we use, particularly the enzyme induced in the valparate, alter bone density. We need to look for this and measure this. We need to think about metabolic syndrome. Some of our patients, some of the drugs we use increase weight, which can be detrimental. We know the MH, MHRA have issued new guidelines for valparate in women of reproductive age. And we need to be mindful of those and use the pregnancy prevention program. And we also need to be aware that some of the drugs we use affect the contraception our patients are using, particularly enzyme inducing anticonvulsants and valparate and the motrogen. We need to explain to our patients that there is a risk of pseudo and what can be done to mitigate that risk and that needs to be reviewed regularly. We need to make sure our patients are safe at home, that they're not isolated, they have employment opportunities and they're given the right benefits of rice and the right access to support groups. Epilepsy nurse specialists are excellent at doing all of these things. And if you do have a patient with drug resistant epilepsy, it's always useful to confirm the diagnosis and refer on to a specialist centre if you're not sure. Thank you. Now, there is an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, which of the two? The, not the chat room. Just, the Just use the Q&A um, and we can respond to some of your questions. Do we have any questions at the moment? No questions, oh, no questions at the moment. This is um, one of the drawbacks of doing webinars. It's very difficult to get um, a feel for who's listening and um, what, what the issues might be and what questions you might want to ask. But do feel free to ask any questions through the Q&A. How are we doing for time? Quarter to three? Yep, yeah. so as, as there don't seem to be any questions, we'll hand over to my colleague, Sue Wood. Um, who will talk to you about ketogenic diets. Um, and we've all learned a lot from Sue and I think our service wouldn't really exist without Sue's support. Hello. Hello, whoever's joined us now. Um, so we're just going to uh, now run um, the next stage of the webinars, which is all about ketogenic diet therapy in adults with complex epilepsy. So welcome all of you who are continuing to listen in or are just joining us um, at the moment. So my name is Sue Wood and I'm a registered dietitian specialising in ketogenic diet therapy um, with adults and children at Matthew's Friends Clinics. 
And so I'm just going to run through um, really just the main areas that I feel are practically useful for people wanting to find out a bit more about this. So for those of you who are familiar with ketogenic therapy and are working in that sector now, some of it may not be too new for you, but let's hope there are a few new things for you to, to look at. So uh, just to cover um, my disclosures and also just to remind everybody that this, this presentation is intended for healthcare professionals only. Um, and so what I'm hoping to cover um, is really just a ketogenic diet therapy focusing on adults. Um, what is the ketogenic diet? How does it work? Um, availability for adults in the UK how we deliver adult ketogenic diet therapy and also just the way that we might deliver it. So focusing on the modified ketogenic diet, enteral feeding, um, and then how we initiate, monitor, and fine tune. Then just a few adult issues pertinent to adults uh, in particular, and then a few questions if there anybody wants to ask questions. So just to start with, what's meant by a ketogenic diet? Um, well, essentially, ketogenic diet mimics the metabolic effects of fasting. And really, the key aspect there is the low carbohydrate aspect. So, really, the low carbohydrate intake determines the change. Um, and then, what we do is we need to add in sufficient fats, which then they become the primary fuel. Um, we need adequate protein. And also, we often do need to have some degree of calorie management or calorie control. Um, in the sort of clinical um, therapy world, we have a number of different therapeutic options. Um, classical ketogenic diet, medium chain, triglyceride ketogenic diet, the modified Atkins diet, modified ketogenic diet UK, and also low glycemic index treatment, which is not, it's, it doesn't tend to produce ketones, um, uh, certainly not large amounts of ketones, but it sort of falls within this family of carbohydrate modification approaches. Um, and what we're going to do is mention really more the classical ketogenic diet today in relation to enteral feeding and the modified ketogenic diet, the UK version really, in relation to oral feeding or normal feeding. So essentially in ketogenic diet therapy, all we're doing is, is switching fuel. That's simply all we're doing. So in a standard Western diet, we might be consuming about 50% of our calories or our fuel in the form of carbohydrate. Uh, whereas when we switch over to um, a ketogenic diet, then we're just talking about about 5% of our, our fuel or calories as, as carbohydrate. Um, and you can see I've just made a comparison between 1800 calories and how that might be provided in macronutrients using these sort of standard set percentages. Um, and you can see that significant change in the macronutrients. Um, and I've left the protein about the same because the reality is um, it's, the pro, it's the fat and the carbohydrate we're really looking at initially to make a significant switch in. And we may bring protein controls in if necessary, but really the, the carbohydrate and the fats are the main switching agents. And so I just took this food pyramid because I quite like the idea of food pyramids. Um, just took this one from the internet and you can just see how um, we just have to have more a greater dominance of fats, natural fats uh, in natural sources. Um, we do include adequate protein and, and really relatively small amounts of carbohydrate from non-starchy sources. And it's also really important to emphasize that nutritional ketosis, which is what we're talking about in um, ketogenic therapy, is actually quite different from ketoacidosis, which is what we might associate with uncontrolled or undiagnosed diabetes. Um, and so nutritional ketosis is actually a, a benign adaptive state. It's a controlled state um, that's, that's insulin regulated. And we don't have excessive unregulated levels of ketones. Generally, they're between one to seven millimoles per litre. Generally, we keep them around the five or below mark. Um, and glucose remains in the normal range. And the pH is also generally the normal range. Whereas ketoacidosis is a very much an uncontrolled state where you've got actually 
inadequate insulin and you've got really high glucose levels as well as of course ketones being generated so they are quite distinctly different and it's important not to um, not to confuse the two so how does the ketogenic diet work in epilepsy management well we we still don't know even after um, it's been used since the 1920s we still actually don't know exactly how it works but gradually more and more we're finding out um, you know that there are so many different mechanisms um, and again we can't exactly pinpoint them but um, the, the, the likelihood is that maybe different mechanisms work for different individuals and for different disorders so we've got the direct aspect of the provision of an alternative fuel which is of course the ketones and we've got the reduced glycolytic flux so more stable glucose levels that might be uh, a, 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 an important component but we've also got lots of downstream changes um, in terms of um, the systems associated with metabolism so there's evidence of mitochondrial biogenesis alterations in neurotransmitter metabolism alterations in antioxidant status um, there may be epigenetic changes, so um, changes the expression of, of, of certain gene, gene processes. Um, there may be a downregulation of inflammatory processes. And also recently we found, or we've, we've had publications relating to really interesting work um, on the gut microbiome and alterations, and how that may be one element, maybe for some individuals, and that's conveying a very important part in this. Uh, mechanism of action in the way it controls seizures. So what about um, adults and ketogenic diet therapy and, um, and why, um, why don't we have more services for adults? Well, you know, it, is, it continues to be frustratingly slow for adults. And, and yet the first papers were published back in the 1930s, the Borkers paper of 100 cases between 15 to 51 years and um, was published all that time ago and that indicated that 56 um 56 percent gained a greater than 50 percent reduction in seizures which is really very significant and at this time really because drugs weren't so readily available then ketogenic diet was used actually for adults and children um, so there wasn't the same differential and, and the question that I really always ask is, well, does an anticonvulsant uh, stop being effective on your 18th birthday when you turn an adult officially? Um, and, and also, should an effective treatment, it's a proven treatment um, with randomised controlled evidence for children, should that be dismissed as an option for those over 18? Uh, and also we've now got conditions such as glute one deficiency, which we know that ketogenic diet therapy is the only possible treatment. So, um, and they may be diagnosed over the age of 18. So what do we do there? We need services for these individuals. And also there's increasing interest in ketogenic diet therapy and the value of ketones as a supplementary fuel, et cetera, for various neurodegenerative conditions. And they affect adults. So with no knowledge within the um, adult sector of ketogenic diet therapy, you know, we're really going to struggle to be able to maybe evaluate those areas uh, well. Now in the UK, we've got um, clinical ketogenic diet services um, in London, Birmingham, um, Bristol and Surrey. And so we've got three NHS services and then the Matthews Friends Clinics, which is an independent service that, uh, that, uh, that NHS patients can be referred to. In Ireland, we've got a service in Dublin. And then, of course, we have got a number of our paediatric ketogenic services actually supporting transition patients, trying to work out what to do with them. So there are obviously going to be some older individuals still being looked after by their paediatric centre. And it's very likely that there are quite a number of adults managing alone. Um, we certainly have encountered or have ended up having individuals referred who started alone out of desperation, and they've done fairly well, but they've, you know, they've had they've had some problems, um, and they mean to have those problems if they've been supervised from the beginning. So why is there limitations to the UK service development for for adults? Well, it all does come down to evidence and, and reality. We all know that you can't actually um, sort of support funding for you know set up massive services unless there's some good evidence for those services. And this is where we stumble. Um, and um, uh, the recent Cochrane database systematic review has looked at ketogenic diet 
for drug resistant epilepsy and again found that the studies really in adults are still limited um, and are generally a very low um, overall quality of evidence. And so the recommendation is that future studies should investigate it um, again, and, and we still haven't really got those, those investigations. So um, again, for those of you who tuned into um, Dr. Mani Bagari's presentation, I think he presented the same meta-analysis. I just thought I'd pop a little bit of evidence into this practical presentation. Um, and this was, um, this was published in, in 2015. There's been another one actually, just very recently, um, published in China. Um, but again, similar, similar data. Um, effectively for adults, the combined efficacy of ketogenic diets, whether that be classical approach or modified Atkins was about 42%. And so really we're saying it's comparable with pediatric efficacy, not a lot of difference here at all. Um, and really maybe with adults, what we're considering more carefully is the compliance aspect and all the ways that we can actually increase compliance. So what adult ketogenic heart developments have we in the pipeline? Well, there has been for some time a, quite a lot of effort going into um, the development of a UK adult trial, um, which would be uh, 10 centres in the UK, about 300 patients, randomised to either a ketogenic diet or healthy eating. And enteral feeders would be accepted too. Um, but sadly, that was just, the funding was declined for that when it was just, um, uh, you know, proposed um, and went into the funding, funding uh, reviews just this year and so hopefully that will be presented again next year and may have a better chance of gaining funding because that would make a massive difference to the UK if we could get that up and running. Um, next year there will also be publications, international recommendations for the management of adults um, and this is really as a result of a survey of 20 centres around the world these are not all the centres you're dealing with adults around the world, just the 20 that, um, that, that, that gathered together sort of knew of one another. Um, and that re represents the treatment of, of over 2,000 patients. And so that's really going to be looking at recommendations, experience and what's gone on um, and, and put together some guidelines as a starting point. Um, the paediatrics have had guidelines, some excellent guidelines since, since 2009. So it's about time we managed to get some guidelines together for adults. And certainly publications on ketogenic diet have expanded massively. Um, back, way back when I was at university, there was only 20 per year. Um, at, that's published uh, in PubMed. Um, and 2018, 303. So it is increasing. And of course, it's not just about epilepsy, it's about other areas too. And really we're talking about an old treatment with a new life. So it started out really is something that we thought about in epilepsy way back in the 1920s and also migraine interestingly there was a paper published about migraine at that point but you know we're now looking at a whole range of different disorders whether it be quality of life aspects or um or actually treatment effects there is interest in the wide range of, of, of disorders with possibly this common link of dysregulation of cellular fueling um but you know who knows but there is interest widely now so how do we deliver adult ketogenic diet therapy? Well, I think it's important to uh, realise that it not just, it's not just dealt with by a dietitian. So it has to be really ideally a team effort with that minimal um, team content being, of course, the patient and their carers, um, the dietitian and the neurologist. And so really you cannot function without all those key individuals being engaged. Um, some teams are very lucky to have epilepsy specialist nurses associated with them, which is fabulous. Um, and then obviously we do need the support of GPs for prescribing different items, pharmacists in the supply sector, and also we need biochemical monitoring, so we need biochemistry too. So it is definitely a team effort. So we go about it in a number of stages, and I'll just run through those stages briefly and then we'll look at them in a little bit more detail. So in terms of consideration, then um, we have somebody has to be considered obviously as being, is it the right thing for them? So they will be referred to the medical um, ketogenic team and also have some biochemical screening. Then they need to really go through that pre-therapy discussion 
Um, is it practical? Is it possible? Is it going to be the right thing for them? Then in, we go through a preparation phase where you might do some, um, you obviously have to do education, um, helping them to understand food and how they need to put meals together, talk about blood monitoring, tracking, that sort of thing. And then we go through the initiation of the prescription um, and then ongoing treatment through support, uh, linking with uh, maybe phone, email, and then face-to-face -face consultations. And, and that ongoing contact every three months or so um, is important. Three monthly, really medical input, three to six monthly. Um, and again, rechecking biochemistry, that sort of thing. Um, and ensuring that everything is going well and whether there needs to be maybe any other changes in the treatment. When we initiate this treatment, then there should be no other changes going on ideally. So you want to wait for a quiet patch, no changes in drugs, no major changes in life um, when this is initiated. So then ongoing, then you would look, you would actually um, see the individual six, 12, eight, 18, 24 months um, and, and consider weaning at any point, depending on the circumstances and what's going on with their, their, their situation. So initially, really, this practical aspect, this practical consideration is really, really important. And in fact, um, although biochemistry and checking biochemistry and, and medical aspects are, are key too, if it's not the practical, the right practical idea for the individual, then you're on to a, a losing streak there. So really, they have to be able to commit to spending some time really investing in this, learning about it. Uh, with no other impending changes for, for the three months. Um, and it's better, if, if there is something going on, it's better to maybe defer it until a time when there is that gap so they can really focus on it. They need to be able to make changes to meals, have, be, be in control of meals, um, have some ability to make changes, uh, be able to weigh things, be able to record things and plan things ahead. Again, they can be helped to do this, but um, they need to be willing to do it. And also keeping records is really important. It's, it's impossible to get feedback and manipulate the treatment if, if records aren't kept being kept. So that's an important aspect of ketogenic therapy. So again, just very quickly looking at the medical considerations, the, the key thing is that if an individual has got an abnormality of fatty acid metabolism, ketogenic diet therapy is not a goer, it's not suitable. So that's an absolute contraindication. And it's a very rare situation, but it's very important, I think, that it is screened, um, particularly in those individuals who have complex needs, where we really don't know what's going on with them, where they aren't able to articulate how they're feeling or what's, you know, what's happening. Um, and so I think it's, it's really important that those elements are looked at. Um, at the moment, really, all we've got to refer to is, is the consensus statements relating to paediatrics um, in terms of um, the, the optimal management and, and considerations. Um, but really, when it comes to adults, then we do have to consider things such as familial hyperlipidemia, uh, maybe if there's a history of renal stones, eating disorders. Really, we have to think about those carefully and, and just see whether it's the right thing for that individual. We don't really want there to be any possibility of pregnancy or planned pregnancy. Um, and also we need to be really cautious when you've got issues such as dysphagia and, and, um, and, and, and reflux. And, um, and if there's already chronic constipation, you really need to get that managed before you start. Um, and also issues like type, type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes. And again, you need to think very carefully about that. And, um, and link in with the appropriate team if that's going to be, if an individual has epilepsy and diabetes and the two need to go together. And also we need to be aware though that there are pros and cons beyond the, the positive aspects, potential positive aspects of ketogenic therapy. So again, the, but most of these can be managed, but we do need to tell people about these when we're talking to them about um, the possibilities of initiating and what might happen. So the GI aspects um, can be alleviated with dietary modifications, but you know there, there can be some some about half individuals may may get some problems with their with their gut. Maybe constipation is the most common. Um, lethargy, nausea, and hypoglycemia. Again, it depends on how fast you introduce the regime, and these can generally be avoided um, if it's paced in at a reasonable pace. Raised lipids 
quite common, often transient, and again, the adjustments can be made, and we can talk a little bit about that later. Uh, renal stones, again, three to seven percent data, I believe, came from a children's study, um, and and so it is. It's not that common, but we do need to be aware of that risk. And I think it's particularly important to be aware of it in individuals who maybe aren't able to speak up for themselves and tell you if they're not feeling, you know, not, not be able to tell you that they've got pain and discomfort. Um, obviously, an individual who's able to speak up for themselves can tell you. Um, but I think it is a worry in those that are unable to communicate. Um, and we always, always, when they become well, focus on that as a possible, you know, is it a possibility that there might be renal stones? But we can increase fluids where possible. We can use potassium citrate and, as an alkalizing agent. Um, so there are ways of managing that. It's not, a, it's not, it's not always a stopper. Um, unplanned weight loss and gain. Generally, we can do pretty well in terms of controlling weight. Um, very effectively, in fact, but you know that might occur at times, and so um, it, it just means that you need close monitoring of the the, the dietary treatment. And we do very, very occasionally get some individuals who may have more seizures as a result of this. Uh, and again, it's difficult to know why, but we have had, uh, I think, just two cases: a child and an adult, through our clinic, who have definitely had more seizures as a result of going on to ketogenic diet therapy, and so we stop the therapy. Uh, in the majority of cases, it's not, it's not that situation. So generally, we just have to evaluate the, the risk and benefits all the way along the line and, and, um, and, and just consider and deal with the issues as they come. Again, I just mentioned a bit about biochemistry. There's quite a lot of debate about really how much of this do we really, really need. And um, at the ketogenic Ketogenic Dietitians Research Network. Um, again, we're trying to look at this aspect to see, you know, how many of these um, these tests really are of value. How many? How many do teams really do? Um, there was a, a publication um, for that was aimed at resource limited regions of the world, looking at minimum requirements, uh, which the the reference is dated there, um, which again cut it down to size tremendously. Um, and there has been just published a new uh, paediatric paper, which is quite interesting, in that they looked at um, 91 cases um, on, on diet for a considerable length of time, nearly four years, and really noted that there was not a lot of problems um, appearing, particularly in terms of their um, vitamins and mineral deficiencies. So I think we've got to really discuss carefully about what we feel is essential, um, and what we feel is required. And that may depend on the, um, the health and wellness of the individual as they start out. You know, if you've got a very complicated individual that you don't have much idea what's going on, maybe you do need to do more investigations. And maybe for somebody who's generally well in themselves um, and quite able and well, maybe it, 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 you may not need to do so many, but I think it has to be an individual situation and it's probably an ongoing discussion. So what is a modified ketogenic diet? Let's just talk a little bit about how we would approach somebody who was an, all, an adult who was eating orally. Um, and we would tend to, for simplicity and practicality um, sake, uh, look at using a modified approach. And in the UK, we tend to use what we call a modified ketogenic diet, which provides um, a degree of control over both carbohydrate and fats. And we tend to base the prescription on their dietary assessment, dietary history, and so that the energy is really relatively set up as a, as a, a ballpark figure in the start of the outset. So we, we saw this pie chart earlier on. Um, roughly, it would be about 75% of the energy provided as fat, about 5% as carbohydrate. So in terms of if we're providing somebody with say 1800 calories, we'd just be working around 20 to 22 grams of carbohydrate. So we deliver that as meals, maybe five to seven grams of carbohydrate in a meal, um, and maybe just snacks with up to maybe two to three grams of carbohydrate, but a total of maybe 20 to 30 grams of carbohydrate daily for an adult. We would encourage fats, but also probably give guidance on, on, on portions because people don't naturally 
um, don't naturally get drawn to eating sufficient fat. Some people do brilliantly, but some people just don't. And so they're at risk of losing a lot of weight. And that's why I think in the UK, we tend to choose to use this more guided approach on fats rather than just, just saying, oh, just eat, just eat enough. Um, because we don't necessarily want some of our patients to be losing a lot of weight. Protein is set really at normal, moderate amounts. So we don't tend to emphasize an awful lot about that to start with. Um, just really trying to keep that protein going in at each meal, just small portions, small to moderate portions. Energy is managed and we control energy by encouraging weekly weighing and just seeing and tracking that. We encourage adequate fluids, plenty of fluids, um, not excess, but we certainly don't restrict fluids. And generally we would recommend um, vitamin and mineral supplements and maybe some calcium, magnesium and vitamin D as well. So the initial part of the training really is understanding the food basics. So it's, it's, it's having to look at food in a different way. Uh, and as dietitians, for those of you who are dietitians, we do have a very weird way of looking at food because we don't necessarily see it just as food, we see it as its constituent parts, but that's not normal. <laughs> and so our ketogenic adults don't see food like that. So we have to help them to see food like that. Um, so really it's about understanding where carbohydrate is found, where fat is found, and also where our protein sources are. And then we have to, um, once they've got an idea where this is coming from, they have to know how to count it. So it's about um, giving them some guidance. And we tend to start out with lists because we find that as the simplest sort of way of doing it. So lists of carbohydrates, mainly vegetables and fruits, and also lists of fat sources and really rough guidance on portions so that they can get a ballpark um, a figure sort of to match the guidance that they're being given, the prescription guidance. And then what we do is we encourage them to use a simple meal planning sheet and then work their way through just building a meal from foods that they enjoy. So they would select a proteins portion to start with, then they would think, right, okay, I've got that bit, now I'm going to need to add some carbohydrates. So what am I going to have to, to maybe give my five grams of carbohydrate? Right, well, I'm going to select these vegetables or, or, or these fruits or whatever. And then, of course, they've got to think about adding some fats. So where are they going to get their fats from? And it just going through that simple process of almost like building from those basic, basic components can help them in... Um, and just getting a few ideas together and thinking their way through that. Um, and, and then they then soon understand that you can actually still build the same sort of, the same values um, with uh, the same values of carbohydrate and fat, but you know, the meals might look completely different. So um, you've just got completely different ingredients, but you can still muster up the same amount of, of carbohydrate and fat. And that's a surprise to people to start with. Now, what we did, what we have produced, and uh, as we found, our adults certainly have found it very, very useful, is, um, is a book that has produced, that's got a whole range of recipes in it, breakfasts, lunches, dinners, um, and snack ideas. But what, we, what they do is they provide all the recipes that are based on five grams of carbohydrate and 40 grams of fat. So it just gives that initial controlling point. Now, for some individuals, 40 grams of fat is inadequate. And so what we would do is say, well, if you want to use those recipes, just make sure you add a bit more fat. So we would just give them sort of an add-on amount that they would add to those recipes. But this is really just the starting point. And once people have got, get to grip with things, they, they often become really, really creative. They look at websites, they find their own ways, they look at meals that they like from their home recipes and adapt them. And they can be so creative. Um, this actual um, menu, example menu I've got typed up here, was just a rough menu I picked out of this recipe book. Um, and I wanted to see whether we could actually match the vitamin and mineral requirements of, of a woman. And so what I found was just by using the recipes, and picking out a few just different snacks using the, the carbohydrate choices list. Um, I actually found that it almost met the requirements for um, a 35, 45 year old female. And in fact, I just added, I think, 100 grams of baby spinach to get everything ticked. So what I just would like to say there is that, although I think it's a good idea to recommend vitamin and mineral supplementation, 
as a means to top up. Um, if you actually analyze some, uh, some individuals' diets, they can be great ketogenic diets, they can be awful ketogenic diets, but actually some individuals are doing brilliantly because they are choosing really simple nutrient-dense foods and, um, and their intakes are actually better than we think. So, but it's always useful to do food analysis and even food analysis as you go along if you can, just to check how they're getting along. Now, what about enteral feeding? Enteral feeding is something that um, you know, we do use um, quite regularly, but for adults, it, it can be a little bit tricky because we've got to start almost making a homebrew idea because there aren't really set, there aren't really set uh, feeds for adults. So in the past, um, or really up to now and into currently, um, we often might use Ketocal 4 to 1 LQ. And just thinking back, I've just been trying to use sort of an 1800 calorie requirement as we've been going through to try and keep that as a standard. But if we provide 1800 calories as KetoCal 4 to 1 LQ, we actually only get 37 grams of protein. So that's really not going to meet the needs of an adult. So uh, what we have to do often when we're making up foods for adults is we have to think about adding extra protein. And so we might use something like Protifar or we might use ProSovs TF. Um, and also we may start to manipulate using things like Maxidule or Polycal or some equivalent too. So we often have to sort of do quite a bit of mixing up. Um, and also at this point, I just want to say that this is the real issue with classical ketogenic diets and adults when we're using high ratios, because um, it's just, these ratios are just a mathematical calculation. That's all they are. Um, and they are, they do end up with um, really quite low amounts of protein carbohydrate combined. And so we often do have to lower the ratios when we're using adult, using them for adults. And that's not necessarily going to alter the efficacy at all, um, but it's just going to make sure that they're nutritionally adequate. Now, just very recently, we've got a new feed on the block, um, Ketocal 2.5 to one LQ. Now what that product is now able to do, because it's been designed for uh, really the, the older or the adolescents and adults, we've got um, a much better protein provision. So although perhaps at times we may still want to add a little bit more protein or manipulate it in some ways, we are setting out with a much better base now. And so that really is, is quite a relief. The other important element is the electrolyte levels are lifted a bit too. And that is often a worry um, when we're using um, the, the, the pediatric orientated feeds for adults. So yes, we've got some great potential here, I think, to, to expand use uh, for adults in entry, entry fed adults. And I just wanted to show you one case um, who has been a, quite, a, quite a, a surprise to us. It's always a surprise when somebody has an incredibly good response. And it's just, I suppose, to illustrate that this individual um, had had seizures since he was seven, drug-resistant epilepsy since the age of seven, and tried um, lots of different anticonvulsant medications. Um, and when he was finally referred to us at the age of 21, um, he was having desperate cycles of uh, seizures and uh, post-ictal migraine and self-harming and screaming, hitting himself. He was, it was terrible for him and his family. And so they were all living a very, very uh, poor quality of life. And um, again, I would say a surprise because we, we never know what's going to happen with these individuals, with these, with these individual patients. We switched him to ketogenic therapy, uh, a ketogenic feed based on actually powdered ketocal 4 to 1, because he was already on a powdered feed in the new hair advance. And within one month, in fact, his cycle did not, that monthly cycle of onset of seizures never occurred. And then he improved then on. So the result is he's seizure free. He doesn't have the pain. Um, he doesn't, he dribbled excessively. There's no dribbling. Um, he has very poor circulation that's improved. He does seem not to catch bugs anymore. Um, he doesn't get all the colds and, and problems he had. And he's just much happier. He's relaxed and happy most of the time. So for this family and for Matthew, um, this ketogenic therapy has been, he's a super responder, what we would call a super responder. 
Um, but you know, how many more Matthews are out there? There are a lot of individuals out there with complex epilepsy who are dependent on enteral feeding because of their complexity. Um, and um, they have not been given the opportunity to explore ketogenic therapy as children. And right now, they're not getting the opportunity readily to explore it as adults. And, and that really has got to change. So just a bit of a, about his, his feed. So um, because he was originally on a powder, we felt we'd keep it to that. Um, and so he's a mix of ketocal powder, maxigil, some pro source to boost his protein, some low salt to get the potassium and sodium in. Um, and that's mixed and given us four bolus feeds. But he also does like yogurts and things. So he's actually on a mix of Koyo coconut yogurt with a little bit of apple in it twice a day. So that provides actually a considerable amount of calories to him. Um, but that's his diet. It suits him. And he is seizure free as a result of it. So going on to just um, initiation and prescriptions and going through the process of starting somebody off. I think this aspect of initiation is really, really important. And I, and I think it's probably most important to say that there are lots of ways of doing it. And, um, and so it has to, the most important thing is that it suits the individual. And in fact, it was the Birmingham team, um, that's uh, Manny Baggery and Jude Munn, who started out finding that their adults really were struggling with really um, setting out rather fast on ketogenic therapy. So they decided to really change one meal a week. So one, one week, maybe start with changing their breakfast, next week their lunch, next week their dinner, and maybe the week after change their snacks. And that seemed to work quite well. And um, there was definitely less problem, less anxiety in trying to get it all sorted at once. And they seemed to get the effectiveness just as well. So I think it really does depend on the individual. Um, we often start, we maybe have two or three days maybe two to three days with one meal then add another meal for two three days and then another meal for two three days so we don't necessarily go week by week but really it's entirely um up to um the you as the the, the, the team and also the patient involved and how you how fast you want to take them in we mentioned the issues of possible hypoglycemia maybe nausea lethargy some people who actually grade their diet down you know they've already been on maybe a quite a, a low gl diet for a while and um you know those individuals sometimes don't notice the changes so much they don't feel those symptoms of change um whereas if somebody's been on a really high carbohydrate intake or one of our young women who'd decided she was going to start on a 10 gram carbohydrate diet on the monday so all weekend she ate chocolate <laughs> by thursday she was in the hospital <laughs> Um, you know, that's, that's probably not the ideal way to do it. Um, and so, it, you know, this idea of actually grading in for practical purpose and possibly just that um, enabling adaption purpose, it, 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 it can be a good idea. But during the first week, it is important to tell people that they might not feel quite right. And you might feel a bit tired, you might feel a bit... Um, a little bit off, a little bit flu-like people describe it as sometimes. And this is while the, the body is just adapting, switching over from predominantly fueling on carbohydrate to predominantly fueling on fats. And so people, if, if an individual is, is a very well able individual and they normally go out, you know, they go to the gym perhaps and they do some training sessions, then maybe they can leave that off when they're doing this transition week or transition two weeks you know, it may be that they won't feel as well as they should. So give it a bit of time. You need time to adapt. Take it easy when you're doing this. Um, and drinking plenty of water is important as well. And maybe even adding some extra salts to meals um, during the transition period, because there does, uh, it is suggested that there is a sort of a switch in, in, in a loss of sodium from, the, from the, the body via urine and that potassium follows. And this may be also part of this sort of adaption and that's this sort of feeling a bit floppy and, and, and lethargic initially, which then should pass, um, you know, should pass very quickly. Um, but um, these, it's important to just tell people they may not feel quite right and get them to call you if they don't feel quite right and ch chat them through it. Monitoring is really crucial to optimize. And I don't think there's any difference really between children and adults here. Um, 
Um, and so it's about them understanding that they've got to self-monitor. Um, they need to track what they're eating. Um, they need to weigh themselves weekly. Um, they need to track their symptoms. And that might not just be seizures, it could be other sensations. It could be that they, they need to track their, um, their energy levels. They maybe need to track um, some other aspects that are important to them, but it's really important to know about all those elements. They need to tra track uh, maybe blood or urine ketones. We tend to use blood ketones, some teams use urine ketones. Um, and, and there needs to be that regular contact and certainly access for queries, because in the early days, there can be lots and lots of queries. And if people are worried and they can't ask questions, then they may just stop or they may get into difficulties. Um, so I think it's important to realise the first few weeks are really can be difficult for individuals that are, might be a bit anxious, a bit unsure, lacking confidence, don't know what they're doing, and they just need lots and lots of reassurance. But if, if you can reassure them and educate them and help them to understand, then they often just, they get to a point where they really are self-managing and they are in control. Uh, and that's really, really important for them. So this navigation is, it, this contact to enable navigation is really, really important. Um, just a little bit more about, again, um, the weekly monitoring um, and what changes to look for. Well, seizures are relevant, of course, very, very relevant. Um, but we're also looking for other things as well, other background things that people often comment about, such as alertness, feeling less tired, more tired. Um, you know, all those aspects, weight changes, it's really important to ask about all those things. It's not just seizure numbers. Also, the quality of the seizures is relevant. You know, are they more intense, less intense? Are they stopping sooner? Um, some individuals are really surprised where they can, if they get a sense of a seizure starting, and they think it's, it's starting, they get the adrenaline rush, they think it's all happening, and then it suddenly stops. And they get really, really worried because it's just not right, it's not normal. But that can just be the sign that things are starting to change and um, that, that seizures sometimes can just almost peter out, so they just don't run their course. And this is a very characteristic change associated with ketogenic therapy when it's working. Um, we need to know about um, elements such as the bowel function. Dietitians are always asking about bowels, aren't they? We always need to know about all these aspects because we need to make sure that we deal with issues and make adjustments before they get into a problem, really. The other thing to be aware of is if, um, if your patient develops a cold or a tummy bug or any other in, you know, in current illness, then metabolic control will deteriorate. So seizures may come back, even if they've, they've been under good control, they may return. And the individual may not feel very well at all for a period of time, but that's quite normal. And they just need to be encouraged that their control will come back. The other thing to be really aware of is that it's symptoms we're aiming at. We're trying to control symptoms. And so ketones are not the be all and end all. So ketone levels are not the thing. They only become more of the thing if we're not getting the responses in seizure control that we're looking for. So the first thing to look for is, is symptoms. If we're not getting those changes that we're really seeking in symptom change, then that's when we think, all right, can we get, you know, is it, are the ketones, are they getting ketones? Can we elevate the ketones? Can we alter the prescription to adjust this response? And just wanted to show you an example of a tracking form that we would use, a home tracking form. Now, I have to say that this is from a multi care setting and um, you'll see it's back in 2014. They still send us detailed, lovely detailed stories about our patient's day and what she's been doing, which is really quite helpful because if she's had a very active day or a more lethargic day, it can help us see what's going on. Um, we don't, they don't know, they don't any longer do um, tracking, blood ketone tracking twice a day. Um, but, you know, it's a way of actually getting feel for what's going on in the individual's life. And, uh, and so it, it's a good way of just seeing what's happening over a week. We do have to make sure that we're providing guidance for individuals on managing illness. You know, uh, illness happens. And so um, it's important that they don't take maybe normal cold remedies like Lemsip and things like that, which are full of sucrose. 
Um, you know, we just got to give them, make sure they've got information on hints and tips on how to deal with illness and also encouraging them to get in contact with their keto team if they, if they have any problems and also providing a, a recipe for a meal replacement shake or maybe a soup or a sort of thick day sort of um, replacement if required. So they've got something that they know they can do. Hospital admission is basically a nightmare um, because uh, it's so difficult to um, manage a ketogenic diet in hospital um, with the normal um, food availability in hospital. Um, and so essentially, if it's a planned admission, that's great because you can actually get to talk to the team maybe where they're being admitted to and try and get some, some sort of plans in place. Um, but essentially, they do need to take their information into hospital their monitoring equipment and any supplements that are with them um, and also taking meals and snacks and things or get family to taking meals and snacks if they can um, because it, it you know as you can see from this picture um, this is a meal actually presented to a gentleman with a brain tumor who's on ketogenic diet in hospital and you know you can't adapt that meal i'm afraid there's no adaption to be done you can't remove anything and make it any better um, so it is really, really key that people are aware that it's difficult, they can't expect to get ketogenic meals in hospital. Um, and so some sort of um, contingency plans need to be made. Now, what about supplements? We mentioned about supplements earlier. And yes, I think, I think it's a really good idea to offer them and re recommend them as standard. But I think as we go through, it's good to just do checks um, and do dietary analysis and make sure things all the boxes seem to be ticked and they're doing okay. So multivitamin and trace element, sort of a one a day adult product generally is fine. Sometimes we can get them on prescription, sometimes we don't. Um, and, uh, and, and also with the calcium, vitamin D and magnesium, again, some adults end up having to buy their, their, um, their supplements rather than getting them on prescription. Other elements that we might use as fine tuning elements, uh, such as MCT oil, again, that can be prescribed or some individuals choose to buy it. We would advise it and if, if, if they're unable to get it on prescription, then they can buy it over the counter. Uh, we may recommend uh, or suggest trying fish oil supplementation for some individuals, because possibly if their lipids are awry, um, Again, it may well be um, L-carnitine is something that we may also suggest. Um, that may be prescribed for some individuals, but also maybe, uh, again, purchased over the counter. Um, where bowel issues are concerned, we may be looking at prebiotic manipulation. Um, again, trying to alter, certainly alter vegetable and fruit consumption, but also may use some prebiotic or probiotic supplements, depending on the circumstance. But this is not all routine. It depends on the individual. As far as prescription only items, so we're talking about the enteral nutrition items or oral nutritional supplements, emulsions, then there is a, an array of things that we can use. Um, uh, obviously, the Ketocal range has got both powder products in different ratios, and also uh, we've got the liquid, um, we've got the liquid product in different ratios now too. So that's very helpful. Um, then we've got the fat emulsions. But again, for I think most adults um, often will use shop-bought fats. Um, and it's only really when we're talk talking about maybe making up some special feeds and things like that, we might be needing to use prescribed emulsions. Um, there's also a prescription-only foods range aimed at really more the pediatric side. Um, uh, we don't generally use them for adults, but possibly they might be of value uh, for hospitalisation. I mean, that, that could be the situation where they may truly come into their own. And that's the key to care range. Um, sorry, this is rather a, rather a blizzard of information, but um, hopefully maybe you can, I mean, I can certainly supply you with these, these sort of information sheets if you wish. Um, this was something I did really just to um, give an idea to the navigation and it's not it's not an absolute this is what you've got to do but what I think it does help you to see is that there are lots of possible um, alterations that might um, might be made um, depending on the concern or the issue that you're dealing with so um, you know we've got down at the left hand side you know is the weight loss the weight gain are the ketones low 
um, but depending on weight stable, weight loss, you know, so it's looking at these possible areas and what you might consider changing to manage it. So it really is more of a, a tool that you could use as you are uh, managing an individual and maybe exploring um, uh, really optimization and fine tuning of their of their prescription. So you, I'm not expecting you to read it and take it all in. It's just there is there is something if you wish, and I can certainly send it to you if you want to uh, if you want to get in touch. So what about weaning off ketogenic diet therapy? Um, adults weaning off now with children we know that um, there is a tendency to have a sort of a fixed two-year term um, because of uh, uh, because of the suggestion if it's worked you know why why do we need to carry on with that treatment and that's we use a similar sort of principle uh, as would be used for anticonvulsant medications um, but i think with adults it might be slightly different in that we have to really look at patient response and patient wishes so of course we would wean off um, if it's really just not effective, you know, if it's not delivering what that individual is looking for or what the carers are looking for, then after three or four months, uh, a good trial, then you would wean it. Um, and then otherwise, if it's effective, um, then you would look to um, really start to talk about really adjustments, probably uh, even before two years. And in fact, there are many of, many of our young adults maybe who are really controlling this for themselves, they get into situations where they almost do challenge themselves. So they might have something by accident or they realize that they were given a, a standard Coke in the bar, you know, somebody didn't check and they got a standard Coke, not a Diet Coke, and they get a significant response from that. And they, it, it, it helps them to understand that, you know, it's working for them. You know, this, this carbohydrate control is delivering something. Um, and so what we do often find is often people are aware whether it's really doing something or not. Um, but we would always try to talk to people about the possibility of maybe just reducing their dose of treatment. So could they maybe just lift their carbohydrate a little bit more? You know, could they manage to get a bit more, a few more veggies into their diet? Just see if we can just, just push it a little bit further um, and, and just see if we can make it a little bit less restrictive. But that really has to be agreed on an individual basis. Um, because some individuals are really, um, you know, this has made such a big difference to their lives. And we have to understand that impact and that they may be very, very reluctant to give up something that has, is the being the only thing that's delivered that. So it's really important to be sensitive to that and really work in a very practical way and look at it and look at the benefits that they may gain um, and really look at the risks and benefits side of things. And so for adults, you know, we may, we may need to consider longer term treatment and certainly those with gluten one deficiency or other conditions which respond particularly well to ketogenic diet therapy you know we may be talking about much much longer time of treatment you know entry fed we have got entry fed individuals um, who we we are going to explore certainly going to explore trying to reduce the dose so make the make the feed slightly less ketogenic um, but actually the weaning process is quite tricky um, and, um, and so we, you know, we will do that, um, but we can't particularly see the value of actually weaning somebody who's on you know, uh, a ketogenic diet onto what we might say a standard feed. I mean, most people who've been on ketogenic therapy probably don't go back to a normal diet fully. They never seem to, most of them don't quite eat the same after being on ketogenic diet. And yet with enteral feeds, you know, we really don't have a lot of scope there, um, you know, between a truly a ketogenic feed or a truly, uh, you know, 50% of the feed delivered as carbohydrate. So, you know, there is one product, um, an Abbott product, which is, um, I can't remember it, I'll probably remember it towards the end of the presentation, but there is one product that has got more fat and less carbohydrate in it. Um, and maybe that's a possibility as a halfway house for some of these individuals. So not having to push them right back onto really what we would consider a very high carbohydrate diet. So it's really got to be individual, um, individual in terms of weaning for adults. Uh, lipid concerns, the impact of um, the diet on lipids. This is a big issue, not just because of this treatment, because fats and adults is such a big issue anyway, just in the general public 
arena. So we have to be very, very mindful of this. And there's no question about it. Some individuals' lipids do elevate significantly on ketogenic diet therapy. And I think one of the most important things to do is for them to have lipids checked at baseline. And some of the individuals that come to us who've already initiated ketogenic diet therapy maybe haven't done that. Um, and it could all be that their lipids were really quite high to start with. And so it may not have been the therapy that did it, but they could have already been quite high in the first place. It's difficult to say, but I think it's just important to monitor. So baseline lipids are really crucial and then ongoing every three to six months to see how things are progressing. Um, but there have been two interesting papers from relating to adults from the, um, the Hopkins um, the Hopkins team, who've done most of, uh, done a lot of this work. So um, again, suggesting that adults, um, although the total cholesterol and the LDL uh, cholesterol rises, it may rise significantly in the early months. By about 12 months, it generally has normalized. But there are going to be exceptions to that. There are going to be exceptions. Um, the other interesting aspect is that the HDL cholesterol does tend to elevate, and of course, the triglycerides tend to remain unchanged or quite low. Um, and, and so that's quite a positive element. Um, but certainly in the um, a, another recent another recent trial by um, again, that team looked specifically at other aspects of cardiovascular risk. So they actually looked at the um, the actual carotid um, intermediate thickness. And, and looked at plaque presence, just to really study individuals who'd be on ketogenic therapy more closely. And they did come up with some interesting guidance there or interesting findings in that um, they did find that there was a higher prevalence of the small, low density lipoprotein particles. Now there has been a suggestion, certainly there was a suggestion from Volek and his team back in, um, I think it was probably about 2009 or so, um, that in fact it was the opposite, so that you used to get more of these larger, fluffy, friendly um, lipoprotein particles present. But the suggestion from this recent work is that it is not so. And so we do have to be mindful of the, 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 these elements. And it's so important that these individuals are evaluated as a whole individual and their risks are evaluated for that individual. So, you know, if they've lost or they've lost weight, um, you know, their, um, their, um, their, their, all their other parameters are really very, very well controlled and, you know, their risk factors maybe are not that high. So it's always important to look at the individual, I think, rather than blanketly um, suggesting that this is always going to be a problem. But if lipids are high, then there is practical guidance that we can suggest. And we can look at dietary manipulations, we can suggest maybe manipulating their fats a little bit more. We readily don't emphasize a lot about reducing saturated fats at all. So we only do that if we have to. Um, so we may uh, try and really look at their fats and try and manipulate those, I include more nuts and seeds, include fatty fish, uh, maybe add fish oils and possibly look at carnitine. So there are things that we can look at. Pregnancy, uh, I just mentioned in the contraindications really when we're looking at considerations, really this is an area that's very much unknown. And although I have seen on the internet individuals, not with epilepsy of course, but individuals talking about being on ketogenic diets and pregnant, this is something that we really don't understand as yet. Um, and so we've got no evidence for, for or against. Um, there has recently been one published uh, paper looking at a case series of two, um, and, and so there is a link to that um, in this slide, um, and you can get the link from the Matthews Friends website. But you know, it's really an unknown area. And, and this is quite tricky actually, because of course, anticonvulsant medications during pregnancy, there's a great, there's a great concern about the use of certain anticonvulsant medications and so at, at certain doses in pregnancy. Um, and so there is a really fine line to be trod there, but I think we do need to learn a lot more about this before we can, we can advocate it and suggest that this is absolutely fine and, um, and people can, can, can go along with this. So just to um, look at a few helpful books for reference, some of you may be familiar with these. Um, I have found that this 
um, the most recent book, um, Kidney Data Metabolic Therapies, has been excellent and, and very recent review published in 2017. It's quite pricey, I think it's about £65 when I bought it, but it's a, such an excellent book and a really valuable reference. And if you could maybe get it for your team, that would be, um, that would be great. Um, books just to read and find out a bit more about um, ketogenic approach and low carbohydrate living as the Jeff Bolek and Stephen Finney books. And again, for those of you interested in finding out a bit more about low carbohydrate and sport, because some individuals are very keen, or you may have patients who actually are quite fit, like to keep fit, and actually want to know more about the, their ability to, to keep themselves fit and, and want to know a bit about this uh, aspect associated with low carbohydrate diets. There's also lots of inspiration out there in terms of books. Um, we tend to, for our adults, we start out by actually suggesting that they look at the Real Meal Revolution, which is that red book on the left of your screen, um, or Superfood for Super Children. Same sort of, same group, same style, lots of colourful pictures, lots of inspirational ideas. And people often look at it and think, oh, right, I, no, I like the look of that. You know, I can see what meals might look like that are lowering carbohydrate and higher in fat often people just need a bit of inspiration um, and then they can learn how to obviously guide their portions but it's just about having an idea of what their what meals can look like and um, and so you know there are lots of lots of books out there nowadays that people can pick up and have a look at there's lots of food inspiration on the web as well we've got obviously Matthew's friends we've got keto kitchen um, Charlie Foundation, we've got lots of other web websites out there such as Ruled Me, which again is a very strange one, you can't exactly find it under ketogenic, but a, that's a really good website for, um, for recipes, it's called Ruled Me, and then Cooking Inspired by Love as well is another one, which again is ketogenic recipes. So in summary then, ketogenic therapy can be effective in the management of difficult epilepsy and associated symptoms in adults. Um, we certainly need RCT evidence um, to enable funded adult services in the UK. That's a real stumbling block um, and we can't see our way through that as yet. Um, and it does require the individual to want to do it. So whether it be the carer or the individual, they have got to make significant changes to their foods, choices and their meals. It does require support and ideally support by somebody who's been trained in this area um, to initiate and monitor and optimise the outcomes. It does take a bit of navigation, some people not a lot of navigation, some people a lot of navigation to reach that optimal point. And we do need to continue um, supporting research really into mechanisms. Uh, really supporting research into other ways of achieving this effect. You know, if we could achieve this ketogenic effect in a simpler way, you know, we do it, our job would be done, we'd be off doing something else. But sadly, um, we still can't manage to achieve that. So there is exciting research going on, um, looking at, you know, looking at MCT type supplements, looking at um, elements such as triheptanoin, um, looking at ketone esters, but none of these areas are really in, they're not in the clinical field as yet. So um, there's lots of promise and, uh, and, and hope that we can maybe find easier ways to apply it to a, a wider range of people who might need it. Um, so that's to, to arrive in the future, I believe. And I just want to say thank you for listening. And certainly if you want to ask any questions, then please, please feel free to do so. Um, I think you can just type your questions into um, onto your screen, and um, and we can see if there's any any questions coming through. Looking to my team to see if there's anything happening out there. Is anybody there? <laughs> I mean, I I think sometimes. I mean, I've I've watched webinars before and thought. Oh. Oh, no, I don't think I can ask any questions right now. But, you know, if you do have any questions, do feel free to, to email. Um, our, um, my email address is on there. 
Um, if I don't know the answer to the questions, I sometimes do know somebody who does know the answers, or I can ask other people for you. So um, do feel free to, to make inquiries. Um, and also, uh, while I'm just chatting, um, I didn't put in a slide about the Ketogenic Dietitians Research Network, um, which again is a group of individuals, mainly dietitians, uh, but also there are um, there are other associated individuals um, with, within the group, um, and it's a way of actually um, getting individuals who are interested in this area together to develop really our practice, understand our practice better, and uh, run projects to try and evaluate that and publish it. So um, there is a link on the Matthews Friends website to the KDRN, um, and Natasha Scholler is the chair of that group. Um, but again, if you find you can't, you want to track that down, you can't find it, then do just come to uh, my email address and I will certainly pass it along. So if there aren't any questions, um, then I'd just say thank you um, ever so much for listening and, and thank you to Nutricia for giving us the opportunity to talk to you about this area. Um, and, and goodbye and hope to um, see you and speak to you soon. Thank you.